Turnover doesn't matter. Profitability does. Business of Architecture UK, episode 32. Hello and welcome, Architect Nation. This is the podcast for architects where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running an impactful and profitable design practice. Hello and welcome. My name is Ryan Willard. I am the host of the Business of Architecture UK podcast. And this week's episode is super special. This was taken live from our event that we had last month on October the 15th at UNI offices in Victoria, where we focused on the business essentials for any architecture practice. We were looking at cash flow, money and profit, and of course, making impact with our design. And we had a wonderful guest uh, discussion panel, which you'll hear on this recording. Um, we had myself speaking. Uh, I kicked off the evening, and you'll be hearing that talk as well. And we also had our uh, sponsors of the evening, Simon Berry from Fresh Projects. He was talking, and you've I've released some of that uh, content already previously because he did a fantastic uh, fee calculation exercise with the audience. On the guest panel, we had Roger Solokovic, we had Melis Hayward, we had Tasman Curley, Joe Cowan, and... Johan Taft and it was a fantastic talk and they were going into a lot of depth about how they make profit, how they set their fees and obstacles that they've overcome whilst running their businesses. Now before that I wanted to let you know about a very special weekend that is designed specifically for practice owners, directors and senior managers of architectural businesses who are looking for consistent growth in their businesses or perhaps they don't have the kind of clients that they want. Maybe your credit control is not really in control. Maybe you're constantly being pushed down on price. I know what that can feel like. Uh, maybe you're doing really unfulfilling work. Or maybe you're chasing projects that just never seem to materialize and just putting so much resource into doing that that it's becoming a difficult cycle to break out of. So this weekend, is for you and it's not going to be an easy weekend this is not going to be an academic style architectural conference where we listen to lectures and look at beautiful pictures of buildings um, this is going to be a practical hands-on weekend where you will face the obstacles in your businesses with the expertise of Johan Taft um, and it will really leave you looking very differently at your practice um, after the weekend. And it might be one of these weekends where we need to book Monday morning off to kind of let all the ideas uh, percolate into our minds. But it's going to be a fantastic weekend. And if you're, it's booked out for the January 19th and 20th. Um, if you want more information, please email me at Ryan, that's R-I-O-N, at businessofarchitectureco.uk. So I look forward to sending you more details on that. So without further ado, please enjoy this week's podcast. My apologies at the beginning. It is the sound is a little bit clipped, uh, but it does get better after the first few minutes as the audio engineer sorts it out. So thank you very much for your patience with us on that and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Selena. And hello and welcome. Absolutely amazing to see so many familiar faces, old friends, and architects that I admire, admire. And it really is just quite touching to see how many people are interested in the business aspects of architecture. And it's an absolute delight to welcome you all here. So thank you once again. So a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Ryan Willard. I'm an architect. I'm the founder of the Thinking Hand Studio. Uh, I'm also the host of the Business of Architecture UK podcast. And I'm also your host this evening. And this tonight is called business essentials, and it's about cash flow, money, and profit. And we've got quite an exciting array of events and people speaking. We've got Simon Berry, who is the CEO of Fresh Projects, which is a software company that specializes in practice management systems for engineers and architects. He's going to be leading us through a cash flow exercise. And then we've got a panel discussion where we've got Johan Taft, we've got Roger Zologovic, we've got Tasman Curley, we've got Melissa Hayward, and we've got Joe Cowan who will be sharing with you their profit-making secrets and how they run a practice. So, and there's going to be questions and answers as well, so you guys 
whilst you're listening, think about things that are important to you or what you want to know about business, and there'll be a little section there where you can ask those questions. We're also going to have a little bit more networking towards the end of the evening, and there's also going to be an opportunity towards the end of the evening for you to find out more about some of our follow-up services and educational programs that we're offering here, both at the Business of Architecture UK and the Architects Marketing Institute. So, as I said before, this evening is about cash flow, money, and profit. But these are really just facilitators. They're, they're facilitators to the things that are really important to us in life. So money really is just a medium of exchange used to pay for things, exchange services, repay debts. And money itself is kind of inherently valueless, but it's the possibility that it affords which is what's so important about it. So what this evening is really about is abundance. And I mean abundance in life, I mean abundance in having fulfilling work, abundance in doing projects which are exciting, they're profitable, you're able to have the kind of money and resources allocated to them, you're able to have abundance in developing a business, that's the kind of culture that you want to be having, and that you're able to have abundance in time. You know, being able to have free time to spend with family, free time to spend with your employees, and again, do the things that are important in life. And really, the most important abundance is abundance in choice, in choice in how you want to live and how you want to run your business. So this is the cash flow quadrant from Robert Kiyosaki's book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And when I started running my practice for a few years ago, it didn't start off smoothly, and I found myself in all sorts of trouble. I found myself having to borrow money. All the money that I'd saved up from working went way quicker than I was anticipating. And I found myself quite limited in my understanding of business and how to run an architectural practice. And one of the books that I read that had a quite a profound impact on me was this book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And this is one of the sort of interesting concepts that I just want to start the evening off with. And it's basically four ways of how you can generate income. Now, it's important to note that no one of these quadrants is better than any other, but knowing about all the different quadrants gives you the choice to know and to ask yourself, where do you want to be and how do you want your business to be operating? And ultimately, it gives you the power to be able to design a business and a lifestyle that works for you. It's important to note that you can become very wealthy and very rich in any of these quadrants. You can also lose a lot of money in any of these quadrants. But generally, in terms of businesses that generate lots of revenue, it tends to be on the right-hand side of this diagram. So just to walk you through, E is employee, i.e. you have a job. Now, most of us, I would imagine, have had jobs. I've started off working as an employee, working for architectural practices, and essentially you are selling or trading your time for a salary. And the priorities here are people that are employees, you know, security, it's stable, um, and it's a very important way, and probably 90% of most people on the planet have some form of employment. The second one is self-employed. So I'd also assert that many of the architects in this room are self-employed. And we often start our own businesses because we want freedom. We want to be able to do everything ourselves. We want to take it into an individual uh, direction. Um, and in this quadrant, you essentially you own your own job. And again, the framework here is you're still selling time for your salary, for your money. On the other side of the quadrant, we've got business owner. So in this context, when we're talking about businesses, this means like a big business. Uh, and in the sort of corporate world, a big business would be considered anything sort of 500 people plus, which is very rare that you'd see that in, in architecture. But what's interesting is that it's your own a system. You have people working for you. You're able to leverage and communicate and build teams that you can help you deliver on the things that you are executing. And the final quadrant is investor. And this is where you own 
your own investments, where you're able to put money in buy assets, and those assets are producing passive and residual forms of income. Now, this um, kind of quadrant really got me thinking about, my goodness, there's so many different ways to earn income. And the sort of transition, our whole education system is focused on the left-hand side. We kind of operate in a, uh, an industrial-aged education system that trains us to become workers or employees or specialists or running self, uh, small businesses. And on this other side is a very different mindset and skill set that's involved. On this right-hand side of the quadrant, other skills become important. Sales is very important. Marketing is very important. And financial literacy is at the heart, where you're beginning to trust numbers as opposed to trusting emotions and opinions. And that personally, moving over from that side, my sort of journey and kind of you know, looking and kind of aspiring to move my, uh, create a business where it's a system and it's, there's levels of automation so I can have more freedom and I can develop teams. There's been a real mindset shift and it can be very, very challenging. I found it very, very challenging in lots of ways. So that's the kind of how I just want to begin the evening and set it up. Great. So now we're going to get to the guest panel discussion, so I'd like to introduce all my guests. We have got Roger Zologovich, please make your way up here, and we've got founding partner of CZWG and CEO of Solid Space. We've got Joe Cowan of Joe Cowan Architects, who's taken a two-man band practice to a 40-person strong practice on the Chelsea, on the Kings Road in Chelsea. We've got Johan Taft, the Navy SEALs of all business mentor who works with property uh, professionals around the world. We've got Melis Hayward, co-founder of Archeo, who has been, they've just done some amazing work recently, and she's also carrying a little one. And we've got Tamsin Curley, who's got a really unique insight into the architectural industry. She's began life as an architect and is now running one of London's premier architectural <laughs> recruitment agencies. So a big round of applause for all our guests this evening. Great, okay, so we're going to jump straight in with uh, the questions. So the first question is, how do you set your fees, and what mistakes have you made, and how have you overcome them? And I'm going to start with Jo. Um, thanks very much, Ryan, um, and very good to see that the members of staff in my office are so far off understanding how much they uh, <laughs> cost per hour to employ. Um, very interesting exercise. Um, how do we go about setting our fees? Um, it, well, in first instance, it depends on the scale of a project. Um, but what we tend to do is look at what the absolute minimum we need is to make a reasonable profit, assuming we run it perfectly and then work from up from there to see how much we can get, basically, to just try and get the maximum fees possible, but understanding where your base point is. Yeah. So we primarily work fees out on a percentage basis in quite a traditional way. We'll track that against a resource forecast. We'll issue that to a client in order to protect ourselves in the event that there is too much fluctuation or variation, but you know, we charge fees in a very traditional way to, I think, most other architects. Got it. Great. Thank you very much. Melis. I've got it. A much, a really long answer or a short answer because it's go, kind of you know, a private passion. Um, I think our first thing we do is ask the client loads of questions. Yeah. I think you, you can really assume um, at first glance and get excited about a project and price the wrong thing. So we always have this uh, theory that you ask as many, you ask so many questions until they ask you a question. Like really, really try and understand what the brief is and what you're actually pricing. Um, and then, and I always try and speak to the decision maker rather than the person in between, because then you're understanding who's making the decision about your fee. And then more technically, <coughs> we have, uh, you know, in a similar way, we test things against standard um, percentages, test them against resourcing, so write down everything we'd have to do and the hours against it. And we have a similar cost rate thing, which we got checked. We get checked annually by a finance guy, so I had no idea how to do that, but I know it's ours is fine. Yeah. Um, and then we also, what's the last thing we do? We have a software which calculates our timesheets with our cost rates, so we can check it against past projects. 
But I think one of the key things we've started doing in the last couple of years, which has made a massive difference, is that we're all, um, what's the word, liable to get really excited about a project and want to win it and feel like uh, you, you don't necessarily know you're doing it, but you lower your fees because you want to win it. Yeah. So we check it. We get a project architect to check it because they've got no interest in being like really stressed. So they'll check all the hours we say, all the deliverables that we write. And um, in that way, we can feel confident that it's not us just trying to win the project, but it's actually realistic. I could bang on, but yeah, that's the sort of fundamentals, three ways of checking it and make sure your scope is really, really clear so that you can come to us for additional fees later. Great, thank you. Mm. Roger. Uh, can I use my slide? You certainly can. <laughs> right. um, so you... There you go. Well, so it's interesting. That, that, yeah, it's it's interesting because this slide uh, was an extract from um, the Financial Times Saturday supplement, and uh, if not, if you don't read them, that's your first thing you must do. You must invest in the Saturday Review because it's <laughs> the best possibility of understanding the way in which the market understands you. And interestingly, at last weekend. Uh, actually, it was uh, the FT talking about fees that you pay to uh, professionals. And I think what's interesting is it, 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 the article started saying it's going to cost you. And from my perspective, of course, I'm slightly on the other end of the, uh, the other side of the fence because I'm a client. So actually, it's what are the fees you're charging me. <laughs> and I think what's interesting is you have to kind of have this in your head because what you're not giving me as a client is at that moment that I'm commencing a project, actually what I want to know uh, is how much is it going to cost and what are the fees and what are the obligations I'm going to do. And that's the point at which if you, can, if you could come to a client with a better understanding of that, your fee sits as part of that. And so it's a bit, you're in a stronger position. And I think it's so interesting that actually Architects are very bad at understanding the cost of the projects. And very simply, they pass it on to a quantity surveyor. And I don't know whether we've got any quantity surveyors in the house, but actually, they're, they are, they're, to my purpose, I'm afraid I don't find them my most popular <laughs> supporters, <laughs> because they actually are, in a way, more interested in their architect chums than they are as me as a client, because actually, what well, that's how, they, how it works. So I, I find somehow often when I'm looking at cost, when I'm looking at value, is what I'm trying to achieve. I've got one more of this. Which one is that? Oh. And this is another one where, where you get a kind of wonderful complexity. So we all can make, we can make a simple calculation in our heads, much simpler than the one we did just now, where 10% of a million quid is 100 grand. <coughs> but we don't know what it's going to cost. So actually, the second part of that slide is the bit that's the most worrying, because I can't be convinced as a client that you are not being incentivized to push those costs up. And so in a sense, I've always argued for a long time throughout my career <coughs> that, architect, that architects' fees should be more in relationship to the value that they're adding. And if you look across the entire piece, from my point of view, when I'm employing both architects and, prof and building professionals, as well as all the surveyors and uh, people involved in marketing, on one side of the fence, I've got a whole bunch of people whose fees are based upon the deal they're doing for me. So they're clearly adding value. And I've got another lot that are on the costs. And I think as a profession, we must, must forget about cost and go straight to value. Roger, I'm going to jump in then. Go Most of the architects we've got at the moment, and a lot of the lead practices, they'll say, let's assume a building costs 300 pounds a square foot. We're not linking our fees to the pound per square foot increase. We're linking to the additional GIA we're creating. Yeah. And that's very clear. As long as you set realistic build costs on day one, it doesn't cost more for a bronze balustrade or more time or effort for an architect mm -hmm. than a you know, stainless steel one. So I think the reality is that most architects working on percentages at the moment are already working on fixed build costs. They're, they're indexing to a GIA, which is exactly that. It's the value add rather than simply being incentivized to increase build cost. Great. Tasmin, Hi. you'd like Hello. to follow on. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Ren. Um, in terms of our response, obviously, we come 
at this from a, an architectural standpoint. Obviously, I'm, I'm trained to be an architect. My husband, who's in the, in the uh, audience today, um, and created this fabulous space for you and I that we're sitting in today, is also an architect. So I'm surrounded by architects um, on a daily basis. I live with one. Um, all of our clients over 19 years, um, uh, large, small, have, have grown at different stages, have some sadly went bust in, in 2008, but we've been through that with them um, in terms of experience. And the two fundament, fundamental issues that we can respond to in terms of recruitment at Place Careers is, um, is obviously during the life cycle, the life cycle of the project, um, uh, obviously starting with planning um, and responding to prolongation, and um, obviously then at site, um, when um, obviously with contractor, sadly contractor delays, et cetera, we, we can respond by um, building up the core team, um, as well as then um, building up the temp staff, um, which obviously lots of our clients, you know, we, 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 we spend a lot of time with the clients' practices um, uh, studios. We see them six months a year. We, we respond um, to their needs before, before their needs arise. Um, uh, and um, I think that's, yeah, so I could go on much longer, but I don't want to, want to take time with Johan. Great. But yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Johan. <laughs> Great, good evening, everyone. Great to be here again. Uh, the, the whole thing about pricing and selling, I think, is a very nebulous one, not just for architects, but for most industries. And I like, very much like what you said, Roger, about the cost on one side and value on the other. I think it's imperative that any business fully understands the cost of his offering so that he doesn't price himself below that cost. Otherwise, he's instantly in trouble. And then once that's done, put that aside and find out exactly what value the client is looking for because people buy for emotional reasons. I don't care what service or what product it is, they buy for emotional reasons and they'll justify it with logic afterwards. If you haven't found out what those drivers are and why they want your design over someone else's design and why they're prepared to pay the extra for whatever it is, then you're missing the point and you will fall into what I would call a commodity type of sale or an off-the-shelf rather than a bespoke. Off-the-shelf is a very different sale to bespoke. And I would like to think that most architects in this room would like to think that they're selling bespoke products. Would I be right in saying that? Your service is bespoke. bespoke. It's not a commodity. Yet you treat it like a commodity. Not all of you, but some of you probably treat it like a commodity when you go to sell it and even when you price it. And that's what retail stores do on the high street. They, they figure out their costs and they look at then gaining market share through driving the price as low as they can and selling large volumes. So I used to work for Burger King Corporation and we used to go into price wars with McDonald's, Wendy's and whoever we could go in a price war with regularly. And we'd put a few lost leading products to drive more traffic in to then sell more of the more profitable products which were basically Coca-Cola and fries. Yeah? not the big hamburgers, they're not profitable. Um, but that was purposely done. And, uh, and, and we'd, we'd spend a lot of marketing budget on driving that. But what you're selling is something very, very different. You don't have a marketing budget to, to do TV advertising. You're not in the commodity world, you're in the bespoke world. But if you don't have a bespoke conversation with your client and find out exactly what, what is hurting him, what he's worried about, what his aspirations are, what his fears are, then you're not tapping into what I say that is, is a gold mine. And you know, people will prepare whatever they the people will pay whatever they're prepared to pay. You've got to find out what that is. Mm -hmm. So if you're starting mm -hmm. from your internal, from your position and not their position, you're in the wrong ballpark already, in my estimation. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Can I respond to that? Yeah, of course. Yes. I think that um, something I learned uh, on a fee writing course was very much similar to that psychology. I think when you start writing a fee proposal, you don't know what that person is willing to pay or what yeah. they're really, unless you really ask what they're really looking for. So the advice that we found really useful is to set a series of options because if they are willing to pay quite a lot and you only put a low fee because you want to win it, you're going to lose all that potential fee. And the same way the other way around, if you put uh, a too high a fee, but it's actually quite a quick, interesting job to get a new relationship then you'll miss out if your fee is too high. So in that same psychology, if you put, a few, if you put options of different um, fees and different services, I think that you're then really saying to the, your client, I understand there's different ways that I could service you here, you know, really light touch or really bespoke, you know, and we don't know each other yet, so what do you want? And I think that's the kind of crucial thing about the fee proposals is 
is it's a way to start to understand how you can work best together as well. It's kind of a really fundamental first bit of relationship building beyond you know, your first meeting. And then that can all be confirmed later. But through the fee proposal, you can actually um, set a really good standing for the, for the years to come, in a way, because it you know, it's, it's becomes a key document mm. for years can, later. Can I, can I say that in, in the relationships that I have with architects and the relationships of my projects as I'm running them, or our projects, is that we're going down a journey. You're all going down a journey. And that journey is going, involved in, in development is, is a journey that's going to go four or five years. And that journey is going to have, you know, it's going to go through kind of ups and downs and moments when the planners are behaving badly, moments when they're behaving well, moments when the client's got problems with their funding and moments when it comes back, moments when the market's disappearing. And actually the most successful architects that I have are the ones that get very close to us. And they actually, as if they're sharing that journey, and actually that is how, in a way, the way in which your fees should be charged should respect or have thought through how long you're going to be spending. You don't have to jump at it all at the beginning. I don't expect you to. I, I think I recognize, I recognize that that's a journey that's going to evolve between the two of us. I don't want to put you out of business. I don't want you to put me out of business. But there isn't anything, there's no reason for me to exploit your services. I want to pay for something that I'm actually getting some value from. So don't be frightened of taking your time over it. Don't be frightened of getting closer and closer to your client. What you really want to do is know that your client can't move an inch without you. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah. I think an another key factor there is uh, understanding who your target client is, and I think there's mm -hmm. a lot of confusion there. I mean, who are you after, and what, what um, pocketbook are you after? And there's mm -hmm. clients at all sorts of different levels, and we, uh, often we, we, we resort to the lower ones because they're easier to get, much easier conversation. We kind of bribe them with, with lower fees, and the impact on their bottom line is, obvi is obvious. I think um, the, uh, Roger's point about co-alignment with your client is very interesting, and um, we as a business have really perpetuated that. Um, when we are looking at what the max we can get, that opening statement, it's actually not that difficult for architects to sit down and do a commercial appraisal of a site and the development on it. You have a piece of land, you do a massing study, you look at how much gross area is, then you look at how many cores, how much net area, then you apply a pound per square foot, you know, 300 pounds a square foot, 250 pounds a square foot, and then you look at a resale value or the PRS model, a rent value, and then you can put in all the different fees, and you need to pop out at the end about a 15% unlevered IRR. And if it goes lower than that, it's not viable. If it goes more than that, charge more. And that's, if architects, I know that sounds complex, it's, it's not that complicated. You need to be thinking, I don't like paper architecture, and I don't like value engineering. I don't think we should be doing it. Um, I think we should be co-aligned in understanding how difficult it is to deliver buildings at the moment. I think we need to understand that our developer client is not actually our client, it's the equity and the fund that sits behind them. From a decision, most of our developer clients are really on a performance fee. They're looking to optimize and see how much money they can make through the creation of square footage. The moment architects understand that, you can start to design with value for money. You can start to present yourselves as value for money. The moment you can speak that language, the moment you can talk to your clients and say, we understand that we really want to achieve 17 stories on this site because that addition of area is going to do this and in order to mitigate risk, you know, we're going to look at this scenario. Or actually, here's a base case. If we do 12 stories on the site, we run through planning in 10 months, we don't have that interest payment for you as a client. Actually, you know, the IRRs aren't that far off, but we've taken a whole bunch of risk. It, when you say getting close to your clients, it's super important, um, particularly once you get over a certain scale. Um, particularly once you're into 60, 70, 80 units plus, because at that point you're not dealing with one. Um, and the architects, most of the biggest successful commercial practices at the moment are doing just that. You know, they really understand the business of architecture beyond sort of the profit and loss accounts important, and it's important to know what your staff cost, but really it's important to know what your building costs, how much profit people are making, and therefore how much money you can make out of it. Well, Joe's, I mean, Joe, I must endorse what Joe is saying because it's, it, 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 Joe is explaining in principle exactly what I'm talking about, which is actually she's looking at her fees as part of the value chain, not part of the cost chain. 
And I think that you, you'll we'll never raise our expectation for architecture until we actually kind of endorse that, buy into it, understand it. And really, I always say, a development appraisal, I've been doing them for a long time, but they really aren't a lot different to a Sainsbury's bill. <laughs> the only difference is you've got all those costs, but the difference is somewhere up there is paying you more than you hope those costs are. I think I'm just going to add to this as well. Architects feel very hard done by um, because they don't use their time wisely. Um, and architects are inherently people pleasers, first and foremost. They think to do the right thing by their client, more and more options work harder and harder, and everyone works through the night and through the weekends, and they don't work smart. And the option that they're working on, because they think it's beautiful, which is important, isn't viable anyway. So it's, it's paid for architecture. It's a waste of time. And I think architecture practices need to get that. People pleasing, this sort of idea that you just keep doing more and more for a client all mm. the time, it's, it's bad for your clients and it's bad for you as an architect. You start to become resentful. You say, I'm not making any money, but we're working so hard. Your client's looking at it going, why well, am I getting bills for stuff that I can't use? You know, it, it's, it's, architects have got to understand that, that those days of the star architect, you know, spending 700 pounds a square foot on a building because, you know, I am Richard Rogers or I am Norman Foster or I am Zaha are gone. We are service providers. We sit as part of a development vehicle. The moment you get that, embrace it and design, thinking about value for money. How can I create the most beautiful building possible within this budget? The moment you understand that and you start to practice that, you'll make money as an architect. Great. Anyone else want to respond to that? Okay, we'll go to the next question. Thank you, Joe. So what obstacles, and this kind of leads on from what Joe's saying here, what obstacles do many architectural businesses face, what, what obstacles has your business faced in making profit and how have you overcome them? So we'll start with, we'll start with Johan because you can talk about some of the, your clients and the people. Say that question again please, Ryan. <laughs> what obstacles do many architectural businesses face and your own business with making profit and how have you overcome them? Well, the first one is they're not collecting money fast enough. That's obvious. When I go into a company, the first thing I look at is their cash flow. And I ask them for unpaid invoices. It's often a stack this big. Some of them are 100 days, 120 days, 180 days. That's absolutely criminal. The architecture firm is acting as a bank. Shouldn't be doing that. So they need to get sharp and um, on the case with collecting money. And it goes all the way back to the beginning, putting in the right having the right attitude around that right from the beginning and um, contracting powerfully right from the beginning. I was speaking with some architects earlier on and we were kind of joking about it, but in the early days they were telling me they would just jump in because they were so keen to do a project and the paperwork, the, the proper contract wasn't really, hadn't really dried properly yet and so that backfired on them. And this happens a lot. Um, so um, pulling money in uh, fast and having a system and having people well trained to do that is absolutely imperative. Um, the other thing I think is the exercise done earlier on, understand how money works in your business. Every business has a particular way of um, understanding how money works uh, and you've got to be good at that in your industry. Uh, understanding costing, understanding uh, the impact of any decisions you make on all the different um, levels of, of finance. So that has to be second nature and um, Clearly, uh, judging by the exercise tonight, that isn't to most people in the room, and I suggest you go on a course or certainly get the software to have that sorted because that's imperative. Um, and the other thing I think is uh, certainly a mindset of, uh, earlier on, I think you, you spoke about, Joe, that um, architects want to please, and you know, you, you, you're artists. I mean, most architects I speak with are artists, really, artists dealing in the harsh business world. and. Um, the architects I work with are specialists and very good at what they do, and, but they end up becoming bottlenecks in their businesses, and they're working too much in the business, not on the business, and they haven't thought out the whole journey of taking a business from creating it to exit, exiting it, and all the different stages in between. And any good project should be thought out that way, and I know you think out your architecture projects that way, from day one all the way through to the day the person gets the keys and opens up um, their, their, their house. But have you done that from a business perspective? And do you have the people in place and the systems in place to keep all that on track? It's important to be as good in business as you are in your trade. And this is not just architecture. I see this with accountants, with lawyers, with um, surveyors, with professionals um, very often. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, just going back to um, obviously, you know, and, yeah, cash flow agreed 100% is, um, is I think every year, every year for us at Place, cash flow has always been an issue. So when we started in 2008, obviously cash flowing in was <clears throat> a huge issue. Um, very few jobs out there, very few practices recruiting. Um, it was tough, and we only had, we, we could only go up because um, we started at such a, a low, a low uh, stage in the market and, uh, and the cycle of the recession itself. Um, in terms of our fees over the last decade, um, we've, we've realized that actually we may initially come across as expensive to clients that, that, that initially meet us. Um, but once we prove to them the value of the recruitment service that we offer, mm. um, and then over years, I mean, some of our clients we have known for 19 years, so I've been doing this for 19 years, placed 10 years um, uh, since we set up, we, we realized that the actual value of those relationships um, and, and introducing people from part one up to director level and, and actually part ones who are now direct directors um, who, are, who are very good clients and long-standing clients are unbelievably, um, unbelievably um, valuable to the industry and, um, and obviously our experience and our interaction with them help them make good choices in terms of hires. Um, Obviously, making a bad hire as a, as a business in, in the architectural world um, is hugely costly and, um, and distressing for, for practices. So we reassuringly give them reassurance um, in terms of the fact that most of our uh, introductions to clients are, are literally via um, referral and rec recommendations. So 90% of our introductions at this moment are referral and recommendation, uh, um, which is amazing for us. Um, we spend a lot of time getting to know candidates getting to know the clients um, and and as I said strategically looking at the business ahead because they invite us to do so um, looking about uh, at the sort of projects overall HR benefits salary benchmarking um, um, and people joke that recruitment consultants bleed the industry dry um, I we strongly disagree at place um, place careers we offer a very valuable long-term con consultative service and and we get paid on a, a very long-term you know, we take a long-term point of view in terms of our income in the business. I've, I've always wondered with recruitment agents how you cash flow something like that because you know you're paying everybody salaries before maybe you've been paid yourself. Well, yeah, and sometimes we we start <clears throat> a senior hire, and sometimes you know a senior director level hire takes six months to a year, and we don't get paid until someone's appointed. But by the same token, you know, obviously with temp staff, we can we have 24 hours to find someone to to complete a project, uh, mm. a package. Um, please, you know, we, we need it done next week, so we, we respond, and it is, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's tough. Forecasting beyond three months for us is very difficult, but I think that's probably the same for most of the industry now. Um, I think historically, obviously, pre-last pre, pre -last recession, it was probably three to six months, I think. Um, uh, and it is tough, but it's, um, but obviously those relationships and those long-term, uh, that, that kind of forward thinking, uh, and, and obviously, you know, we have a lot of commitment from clients, which we've built over years by just doing a bloody good job um, and making them happy. But that's, you, you reap the rewards over, over years. Right. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Roger. Uh, well, for me, um, I, think it, I think architecture is a difficult business, which was um, one, of the, one of the reasons why I moved on into <laughs> development. But uh, I can tell you more of that. Uh, there's a book out there you can buy, and it tells you all about it as well. Uh, I think that why it's so difficult is because when you come in on a Monday morning, uh, you've got uh, you you all week you've got costs that are going to build up, and you've got a, a, almost a fixed overhead, and it's quite hard for you to pull your overhead back. Your overhead is not that variable. Now, uh, when I did when I when I was um, running an architectural practice at CZWG in the old days. It was all kind of before spreadsheets, but I used to watch like a hawk VAT returns that came in on a quarterly basis. And they're very good temperature measure of what's happening. And the only thing that you can do to overcome the obstacles is sell your services. Because actually, your business cannot survive without your customers coming in and you issuing bills at the end of that month. And that is all you need to think about. The costs, of course, important, but actually got to, what you're making sure is the costs will, will, in a way, look after you. If you get the right feedback, you can make sure the costs are sufficient. But what will put, make you bust 
is if you haven't sold enough of your time of your practice for that quarter. If when the month end comes, you can't bill uh, sufficiently to cover your overhead, you are effectively bust. So all you have to do is you wake up in the morning, you think, who am I going to bill today? <laughs> <laughs> when you go to bed at night, you think, who am I going to bill tomorrow? And, you, when you, and in between that, you run out to your client meeting and you're saying, and you're saying you have a wonderful time and you're having a chat, it's all going very well, and you think to yourself, well, okay, you know, when am I going to pop the question? <laughs> I, I, I've, got, do, I've got the contract here, do we die, dear site? Well, I mean, you know. So then you come back and you say, right, now how am I going to get that guy over the line so I'm going to be charging him? And so all you're doing every single day of your life is worrying about where the money's coming in. Yeah. <laughs> who's um, got, who's that's, got my that's money? That's my life. <laughs> <laughs> if I described your you life for you. You just describe my life, it's mm. like you can read well, my when you're, when you're a developer like me, all you do that, I, had a, I used to have a really hard time once a quarter. I had to write these invoices out to these tenants, and it was really difficult. By God, <laughs> nothing in comparison to the, <laughs> the hideousness of having to get those bills in every month. Oh, it's fine. We're just sorted, yeah. Um, <laughs> To answer the question about profit, it's essentially, I always see it as two sides of the fee. You First of all, it's about setting the fee, and then it's about spending the fee. And in terms of setting the fee and getting a good fee, really, it's you've got to be the right architect for the right client. That's the best way of getting the best fee. Architecture is a really crowded market. As Joe said, we all want to please people, so we'd all happily take on kind of any project. And we're not, I don't think as a profession, we're expertise, we're experts in sort of niches enough and I think that um, our best relationships and our sort of where our, our biggest fees have been accepted is where we are like the only architect for that project, where we fit the bill exactly, and that takes a long time to mm. develop expertise. But fundamentally, that's the only way that um, really profitable architects can work. You can't be doing everything and charging a really high fee for it because someone else will come and do the same. So that's the first bit. And then in terms of um, spending the fee, it goes without saying we're a service-based industry, so time is our biggest cost. And so really it's all about project time, and uh, it sort of goes back to the fee proposal and the appointment documents. And I think something that we've set as a kind of culture in our office is being extremely transparent about our fee proposals, our fees, our profitability. We have like weekly resourcing meetings. We use um, software to understand how things are going. But fundamentally, we put our project architects in control of the time that they've got. Yeah. And it's for them to say the client's nibbling, you know, or, or I'm over-servicing this or stretching this. And we have systems in place um, to kind of check in on that on a monthly basis. But we have to give the power to the architects. I can't be checking every single project how it's going. And we also have to communicate the fact that the closer they are to delivering what we've already said we're going to do, the the easier everyone's lives are going to be, actually the happier the client is going to be. It's exactly like you're saying, if an architect spends time working on something superfluous, he's got less time to do the things that actually matter to the client. So I would say it's um, make yourself an expert so you can actually charge really good fees and so that you have the best relationship you could be and be really transparent with the, your whole team and trust them that they're in control of how their time is spent on a project as well. Great. Thank you. Joe. Um, we've had quite a lot of varied responses <laughs> to this. Um, I'll deal with cash flow first. Um, cash flow is difficult. Um, if you've got a good running business and you're not trying to grow it, cash flow shouldn't be a problem. If you are doing what we're trying to do, and, and a lot of architects are, and you're trying to grow, cash flow is always going to be an issue because every time you've got profit, you put it back into the business to grow the next piece, you know, the next R&D. And that for us has been big, very challenging this year because we've invested in two very big platforms, hundreds of thousands of pounds of investment by the business, and both came off. But had they not, that would have been tough, you know, mm. tough to weather. But that's the next stage of growth. And you know, there's obviously always going to be things that you want to invest in to improve and improve how you run the business and the service that you offer. Because in a crowded market, you've also got to stand out. Um, you know, you, you've got to be good. So it's not about... Um, just trying to run with the status quo. So there's quite a lot of challenges there. Um, in terms of um, how we deal with, with profit and how we deal with the business, I spend as much time as possible trying to take a bigger picture, trying to step back from projects um, and really sort of look at them holistically. You know, what do they mean to the practice from a, a sort of from the heart? You know, like, is this a, is this a, a 
you know, a project that we love that, that means a lot to developing the culture and our brand and who we are and it's a long term. Or is this a project that is great bread and butter, you know, it's easy to turn out, you know, it makes a moderate profit. Or is it a flagship? You know, is it a project that we can do both on? And I think we just try and be quite big picture about how we're looking at each project um, and how they're being run because it allows us then potentially to go into the red on certain projects but in a calculated way um, because we know that actually the benefit from a reputational point of view or to the rest of the practice or from a strategy point of view is huge. But inherently, don't run, stop working on projects that are running at a loss. Mm sit down with the team and your clients and understand what's going wrong. Um, it could be that the staff you've put on it are not experienced enough, or the staff that you've put on are too experienced, so they're too expensive for the level of work. It could be that um, that project has this mean of computer training. It could be that the skill sets aren't correct. I mean, there's lots of reasons. Mm. It could be that we set the fees wrong on the mm. first instance. You know, we signed up to a fee that where we hadn't really understood the parameters, but <coughs> I think it's having a big picture and an overview of of all the projects in your office, um, particularly when you get into the multiples, enabling people, as you say, we use the same sort of software to monitor, but, but really think where you're going and how do you spend the money you make to promote that next chapter. It's also okay to say this project is costing us loads. Don't share the same values with the client. Let's walk away. I mean, it's okay to leave a project where you're being uh, kind of badly treated, not valued and we took that decision a year ago with one project and it was better for everyone and gave us the time to then focus on our values and our expertise in housing and win a really great housing project so it was kind of like saying this isn't going anywhere we're paying to finish this project where actually we're not adding anything mm. to it we're not the relationship with the client isn't we, we they don't need us anymore let's see and i think that it's quite a scary moment to say walk away from something, but it's, in the end, can be better for everybody. There's two ways to grow a business. There's a bums on seat way, which is what some of our competitors have done, and <coughs> grow very, very, very fast, and you, you don't control it. Um, some of the bigger practices have done that, and they're now compressing back again. Um, or there's growing more profitably. Turnover is irrelevant. I work for Fosters, who turned over 10 times more than Rogers, and yet Rogers still made more net profit at the end of every year. <laughs> Turnover doesn't matter profitability does, you know, and, and not having to, you know, absolutely kill yourself for it. You know, you need to work smart, and it's something we talk a lot about in our office, you know, that concept of work smart. But, um, but yeah, I think it really is, you know, the, those kind of streams of work and exactly what you're saying. So that is a wrap. Thank you for listening. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.